conceptual stuff, perspective and things. People talk Real about talk, it, it shots. Shots. all of the elements. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse. Uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Hope everybody is having an unbelievable week. Um, I'm going to get right to the point. You saw. Uh, the intro video, so I'm not going to even get into that. Um, this is a little bit different. Uh, sometimes things happen in a way uh, that move you in ways that no matter what you've been through, no matter what you've seen, no matter how crazy life has been, some things just touch you differently. Um, so the first thing I'm going to say is my heart my prayers, my light, and my strength go out to um, DeMar Hamlin, uh, his mother, his family, extended family, friends, teams, uh, brothers in the game. Um, and uh, I am really praying for this young kid uh, who is living his dream. Um, I'm going to give you some updates for those of you who don't have the update. Uh, know what I'm talking about. Last night on Monday Night Football in the first quarter, a second-year player named DeMar Hamlin made a tackle, got up, and then co almost immediately collapsed. Uh, what we didn't know at the time is he was going into cardiac arrest. Uh, we now know that uh, he received as close to immediate medical attention as you can get. Uh, there are doctors and uh paramedics on the sideline. Eventually, uh, they get a uh, ambulance out uh, and they're literally performing CPR on the field. Uh, you can see uh, the devastation in the eyes and the behavior of the players. And it's hard not to be moved if you have any ounce of humanity, no matter how you feel about the sport, no matter how you feel about uh, capitalism, no matter how you feel about it all. There are a couple of things that played out that is where I want to put my attention right now. Again, my heart goes out to his family. Uh, I am lifting him in prayer. The last report is that they did uh, revive his heartbeat. They did get his vitals back to moving, and he was able to breathe, but they have him on a ventilator now. What that does is that relieves the strain of him trying to naturally breathe, which takes stress off the body, uh, which also lowers the heart rate and a bunch of other things. Um, while he, and so he is medically sedated, he's been put to sleep or what uh, is medically known as a uh, induced coma, uh, purposely induced coma, which is going to reduce the chance of swelling, which is going to be the next major issue. I don't know how long um, he was without oxygen before they realized he was in cardiac arrest and started CPR. 
Uh, from what I can gather, I doubt if it was six minutes, normally around five or six minutes is when the brain starts to experience irreparable uh, damage. The brain cells start to die. If he received life uh, saving measures and they were doing CPR and getting oxygen to his uh, bloodstream and getting it flowing um, before that five, six minute mark, then we should be okay. The next couple of days are going to be huge because that's normally if there is any brain damage where you experience swelling. Um, then if it was brain damage and they're swelling and they're able to relieve the swelling and able to, you know, get him through that, then it's just how much brain damage and what type of quality of life he's going to live. So this young brother has a hard road ahead of him. Um, and from what I can understand, he was a good kid. Um, uh, helped in the community even before he came, became a professional athlete. Uh, and it's times like this that you are reminded of the brevity of life. You are reminded of the importance of someone who had a heart attack, someone who almost died. Uh, matter of fact, I had five heart attacks in seven days uh, in 2020. Um, and, you know, cardiac arrest and heart and even a massive heart attack are different. If, with a massive heart attack, your heart is in distress, but it's still fighting to work. It's pumping. It's just not getting enough blood flow. It's, that's a blockage. Cardiac arrest, your heart stops. Um, but as someone who has had that happen and you look around you and you see the people who are a part of your family, and you see the fear and the pain in their eyes and uh, how they feel, you know, it lets you know how things are. Forgive me if I'm not all together because this hits in so many different ways. Uh, even though Marion and I are not together anymore, I remember looking at Marion's eyes when I was in the hospital and I went into that final heart attack in the hospital, thank God. And they were prepping me. They had the rapid response team in there getting me prepped. They were getting me down for an emergency surgical procedure to get the blockage out. And I just looked in her eyes and I thought, what would happen if I left her like that? And how that would impact her. And so he's 24 year old young man to us. He's that lady's baby. You know, uh, she had to watch that. And then, but thank God she was that because she got to be by his side immediately. I couldn't imagine being somewhere else and having to be flown or driven to be by their side. Every, that, that, that would be so just torturous. Uh, every second that you couldn't be there, you're trying to get there. So luckily she was there. She was able to ride in the ambulance with him. Um, but it puts things in perspective. We, you know, we will argue up and down about football. Who's the best this? Who's the best that? Any sport, anything that we see as entertainment, we never look at the humanity side of the equation, the lives, the sacrifices, the things people do. Uh, and this brought all of that into perspective. That game ain't that important. Uh, and I'm not talking about that one game. I'm talking about all of it. Maybe I should have waited. But anyway, let me get off of that because the more I talk about that, the more it's going to hit. And for people who can't understand how it can impact someone that doesn't know the kid, I, I'm not here to explain that today. You deal with your humanity the way you want to. I'm, I'm dealing with mine. Now, <sighs> real quick side note. The fact that it took as long as it did for them to decide that they weren't going to play that game tells us a lot about capitalism. It tells a lot about how we're viewed. It tells us a lot about where money stands in the equation of life and society, especially in America. Uh, this is capitalism. This is business. And I understand it's business. I understand the game 
that game had an impact on the entire season, not just for those two teams, but for other teams as well. And I understand that some kind of way you've got to resolve that. Last night wasn't the day to do that. Last night was the day to say this. there are some things bigger than the game. There are some things bigger than this. America needed the NFL to act a lot more swiftly than it did to make a stamp on the importance of human life and where we need to be placing our priorities in family, in love. They didn't do that. Now the reason I'm here, Skip Bayless. Um, Skip has consistently shown certain things about himself. He knows how to walk that line where you think, well, maybe Skip, Skip's pretty cool. Maybe, you know, Skip says some things and he acknowledges some things and he's been on the right side of a lot of social issues. So you tend to give him a pass. But there's something about his arrogance that reveals itself when something doesn't go his way. See, it's easy for him to say this shouldn't have happened to Brian Flores. This shouldn't have happened to this person and defend things even when it's... Uh, placed on, alongside uh, uh, in juxtaposition to two different sides of something that's racially polarized. He has made some uh, statements that have been on the behalf of blacks, but again, that could easily be PR. What I'm looking at is when your back is against a wall, uh, when your emotions are flowing, how do you feel about uh, the plight of my people? How do you feel about that? Now, Shannon is supposed to be his friend when Shannon... Uh, had a real severe critique of uh, Brady a couple of weeks ago. Um, this guy ripped him and attacked him personally. Talked about him being jealous and not being the player, half the player uh, that Brady is, even though they don't play the same position. And Shannon had a Hall of Fame career. Uh, basically uh, revolutionized the tight end position. Um and, and, you know, it's by all means a success story. But he decided to attack a guy, a guy he talks on the phone with, a guy that talks to his wife, a guy, a guy that you would expect him to have a level of respect for, not to handle that way, especially on national TV. So he's revealing himself. But that was a, te a tweet that went out last night. And it came across me. And I, I don't know, I'm pretty sure a lot of you have seen it. But to it said basically that, he doesn't see how the NFL can postpone or uh, completely suspend this game. It's far too important, but I guess then it's not. Something to that effect. Now, obviously, when the heat hits, the spin doctors are going to put a spin on it and say he meant X, Y, Z. Well, here's what I can tell you. I watched the report on this kid because I was trying to keep up and find out how he was doing. I watched the report. I sit there and watched every second of the report trying to find out how the kid was doing. And so I saw every correspondent that talked from Lisa Salters uh, to Troy Aikman and Joe Buck. Uh, and I'm going to tell you something. Big ups to Ryan Clark. Ryan Clark was unbelievable in being able to give insight from a unique position, but also give humanity to that young man and to the people who play that game. These are people. They play a game. They do something. They get paid a lot to do, but we don't really take into consideration just how easily it can be over with an injury or what we saw last night. And he gave it, he gave it a heart. He made it beat. And that may not be the best use of the word, but he gave it something more than just another thing happened in football. And he did it with class. He did it un under the stress of high emotion, but he managed it. And I want to say big ups to him. I think everybody did a pretty good job. I think everybody came to a conclusion very quickly that this is bigger than football, except uh, Skip Bayless, who was still worried about how the brackets were going to turn out because they hadn't played that game completely. And that game was a bearing on that those two teams and other teams as well. And 
I don't see how they can't play the game. I'm so glad that at the end of the day that the NFL was able to uh, come to a conclusion that from what I can tell and what I can gather and all the things that were put out, it seems like the coaches had talked with their players and they had already decided no matter what the NFL said, they weren't playing. So big ups to the coaches. And I can see that both coaches were shook uh, that they cared about what, what went on. This is one of those few times, and, and, and they happen, where it transcends race, where humanity shows what it's capable of. And I, I really hate that it takes something so dark to show what's possible, because we'll shortly be back to being in the same situation where we're divided as race, as genders, in classes, uh, and it's business as usual. You know, the work I do in the community, I do out of the love of my heart and, and a desire to see my people do better. I try to do it without hatred for those I know who have harmed my people because I know what hate does. But you get frustrated when you see somebody like that. And I'm not even saying what Skip did was racial. What Skip did was elitist. What he did was arrogant. What he did was dismiss the humanity of another human being over something that when you measure it against human life is trivial. And unfortunately, here's the bigger problem. He's not alone. Most other people with platforms just were smart enough not to say it. I guarantee you the conversations that were going on in 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 in, in the uh, top offices of the building in New York uh, that houses the NFL headquarters wasn't as concerned about the humanity of that young man or the humanity of the players or the humanity of the people who were watching this in real time and struggling with it. They weren't as concerned initially because it took too long for them to call that game. It took too long for them to realize that this moment was bigger than football. And it takes me back to a point to where we really need to treat, truly see our value in this world. And what I mean by that, we as men especially, our brains move from front to back and we tend to judge our worth and our value in this world by what we do, especially with our hands, the things we're able to do physically, fix a car, catch a ball, run fast, uh, electric work, whatever. And then we have learned how to be uh, inspired by the work we do with our minds, the things we can capture and do with our minds. But it's what we do that give us our value. But we're more than that. We are a force in the lives of the people around us. We are what we speak in the lives of the people around us. We are the environment that we create for those we love. Skip Bayless just trash. There's no way around it. When he did Shannon the way he did it, you know, for four hours since I was done, I'm not watching the show anymore. Um, not that I watched it a whole lot anyway, but every now and then I get a clip sent to me and I watch it. But, you know, uh, I'm actually currently on a part, I'm on a uh, mental health break myself. Uh, I'm not working with any clients this week. Uh, I'm still doing some things, trying to get some things worked out and caught up. But um, I took a break. And when, the crazy thing is when I took the break, I looked at the calendar. And that's the first time my calendar has been clear for an entire week in over 10 years. I've had breaks. I've had vacations. I've took trips. But I always was doing something before I left or something after I came back. And I realized, man, at some point, you got to put this stuff down and sit back. Sometimes you got to sit up and look at, you got to look at what matters because there's life and then there's not. And 
I'm proud of the life I've lived. Uh, I've had some ups and downs. I've made some decisions that I wish I could get back. But how I responded to those is what has made me who I am. I'm, uh, I, I am proud of the work I do. I am proud how I love. I am proud how I give. Uh, I am proud of the commitments and accomplishments. Uh, but I am extremely aware of my mortality. If I wasn't before 20, March of 2020, I definitely am now. Um, but in, in being aware of my own mortality, it made me aware of, of everyone else's, that no one's promised. The people you look at and take for granted might not be here tomorrow. We need to stop the conflict amongst ourselves. I'm talking specifically about us now. We need to stop it in our homes. We need to stop it in our communities. We need to stop it as a collective. We need to find a way to heal. It's hard to love when you're not healed because love means you're putting out and you're exposing yourself. You're making yourself vulnerable. And you can't do that from a defensive mechanism. And if you're still working from pain, if you're still working from anger and you're still working from frustration, if you're still working from bitterness, you can't love. And if you can't love, you can't build. And at some point, not building puts you so far behind the eight ball, you just get stepped on. Again, uh, as I close, my heart and my prayers go out to the family of this young brother. Um, Is you know, you, you sit up and you think and you let this stuff play through your mind, you know. And those who have been a part of the game at some level, you kind of know the processes. Um, and you, you wake up that morning and you're saying, okay, this, as, as a 24-year-old, two-year player, this is the biggest game of my life. I'm going to go out here and I'm playing my butt off. Uh, I'm living my dream and never in a million thoughts are you contemplating that you won't walk off the field. You know, I can imagine the pride of his mom seeing her son fulfill his dream and and, 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 and being in that stadium watching him play the biggest game of his life and all of a sudden, none of that matters anymore. Her baby's on the field, lifeless. And there's absolutely nothing she can do. It, put thing, it puts things in perspective. I don't know when I'm leaving this place. But I want to leave it in a better place than I found. I want to leave it to be a better place than I found it. I want to touch lives. I want people to heal. I want people to experience love. And that starts with self. We've got to heal. There's so much hurt and anger and bitterness. And it's due to betrayal. We've been hurt by somebody. And I'm not talking about later. I'm talking about early in life. Most of us had some hurts that we haven't recovered from. We don't want to admit it because, you know, especially as men, uh, the need for bravado and toughness is constantly upon us. And we can't say I'm hurting. We can't say I'm having a bad day. We can't say I'm overwhelmed. Not You can't do that. Men don't get under overwhelmed. Men, men don't succumb to their emotions. But it's happening every day, and we're destroying ourselves. Our women are hurting, suffering from abandonment and betrayal, suffering from so much. And we are geared to go on the attack instead of reaching out a caring hand. I hope that I'm not the only person that this touched. I'm hoping that something sticks about this that makes you want to do better. You know, it doesn't have to be drastic. It just has to be enough to say, I want to move different. 
I want to be a part of healing. I want to be a catalyst of growth. You will be surprised how much that can change the world around you. Well, I'm going to get off of here because, you know, I'm in the space right now. But I, I, I really needed to share that because out of all of that, that just hit me. It got under my skin that that's where this guy was and had the audacity to tweet it and, and, and immediately put himself in the scope. You have to know something that polarizing, something that controversial was going to put a spotlight on you. And you chose that moment to do it trash it's a lot more trash uh, out there but that's just my take on it I'm not finna tell you to call and counsel nobody I told you what I'm doing what I'm gonna challenge you to do instead of worrying so much about canceling somebody elevate somebody give to somebody speak some kind words to somebody call that person you being odds with and tell them you love them I want to know, guys, thank you for stopping in. You have an unbelievable.